Good evening and welcome to our health presentation tonight. We are glad that you could be uh, here present or you're watching online. And we thank you for taking the time to, to zoom in. Uh, tonight, we are blessed to have with us uh, Dr. Castrati from the North England Conference. She is the health director, amongst other things. And uh, she has some uh, deep insights to share with us tonight uh, under the, the heading of the gut microbiome. Sounds like a different language. But as you follow along, you'll be more enlightened. Uh, before she uh, presents, it'd be good for us just to bow our heads and offer prayer. Dear Lord, we just want to thank you for the wisdom that you have given. And we pray, Lord, tonight that as Dr. Castrati shares with us on this intriguing topic, we pray that it will be beneficial to us all. Thank you, Lord, we pray. Take full control. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we hand over to Dr. Castrati, and uh, I know that it will be a blessing to us all. Thank you so much, Dr. Herbert. Um, I'm just so happy I could be here today, and uh, this has been planned uh, since long ago. And, and I'm so happy that you could accommodate uh, me. I'm traveling from, Man from Manchester, and it was quite a drive, I have to say. The traffic was terrible, <laughs> but I made it. Um, so so it's, it's wonderful to be here, and um, it's wonderful to get to know you as well. And, you know, while I was driving, I was thinking, will I find the place? And then I realized I have been here, of course, before. <laughs> and, um, of course, um, what I remember most is um, our wonderful conversations we've had with uh, Sister Grace about the social supermarket that is running here uh, si since a long time already. And um, I'm very proud to say that we're also cooperating very well with the community services department. But today, we're here to talk about health, um, specifically um, about our gut health. So we also know the gut, right? It's somewhere here, right? And um, when we think about the word gut, we think about the gut feeling, right? Somehow, this is the feeling that I have. I should be doing this. I should be doing that. And actually, we'll get to that. Um, it's not a myth. There is actually something like a gut feeling. So let me just um, try out my clicker. Does it work? Yes, it does. So um, today's presentation is called the gut microbiome. That's such a difficult word already. Um, and I don't want to burden you with all these tricky, difficult words. So I'm just going to explain what that means. A microbiome is something like an ecosystem. Um, similar to, if, if just imagine a coral reef. So if you go in the ocean and you think about a really nice coral reef, uh, right? So you have there are corals, of course, which are creatures of some kind, right? Then you have fish, you have plants, you've got plankton, you've got the sharks, right? So you've got so you, so you have di different kinds of animals and creatures and lots of life. So a coral reef typically is teeming with life and different diverse life as well. Now, a microbiome is exactly that. A microbiome is an ecosystem with a lot of different kinds of life, animals, plants, and everything in between. So the gut microbiome is exactly that too. So let's just imagine we have a little coral reef in our gut. So there's bacteria, there's fungi, there's all sorts of stuff in between that we don't really know yet because it's still a big field of research. So the gut microbiome has recently become the focus of research because scientists have realized, oh, there's a lot going on. So there were just a few articles and, and scientific papers published per year just 20 years ago. Now there are over 1,000 papers on the gut microbiome published every year because now the researchers have caught on. This is something that we actually need to talk about. So um, what are we? We are technically human, 
right? But now science tells us we're not only human, we're actually something called like a holobiont. What does that mean? Another tricky word. Holobiont means we're not entirely human because we actually have more bacteria living in our bodies than we actually have human cells. So that is interesting. So what are we, right? So it's not exactly, it's not a lot more bacteria, but it's about the same. So we have half of us is bacteria of all kinds of different kinds, and the other half is us. That's our human cells, right? So can we really say we're entirely human? So hmm, it's, 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 you know, it makes me a bit queasy thinking about it, to be honest, <laughs> right? But um, yes, um, we are a holo beyond, and that's exactly what it means. So um, all our bacteria in our body together, all together, they weigh about as much as our brain, about three pounds. So three pounds of us is just bacteria. So think about that. So what would we have in here? We also have in here. Okay, so that's, that's very interesting to think about it, but what does that actually mean? What do we do with that information? Well, let's think about what does the gut actually do, right? So the gut, we know, starts here and it ends there, simply, simply put. Um, it consists of the stomach, the small intestine, and the colon, mainly. Of course, there's plenty of other things in between. And inside all of this, inside this really long tube, um, there's like a mucus layer that protects the cells because we know the stomach is acidic and the stomach acid can actually attack the human cells that we have there, right? So we do need this mucus layer. And the same thing goes for the intestine and for the colon as well. So the gut is this really long tube. It's about 30 feet long. Think about that, 30 feet, right? So that's about the length of two trucks. <laughs> so this is what we have curled in there. So when I look at all those cables there, this is what our gut looks like, kind of, right? And um, the colon, colon very simple to find. It goes up here, whoop, it goes across there, <whistles> and it goes down there. Boop. So this is where the colon is, and the colon is the epicenter, it's the population center of the microbiome. This is where it lives. So both the mucus in the, in the um, gut plus the bacteria, um, they are influenced by what we eat, of course. So our gut, while we're, while we're starting to eat, our gut is waiting and ready for the food that's about to arrive. Right, so um, it's not just a container, but it's actually a population center. It's full of pets that we're going to feed. So think about it. You have about 30, <laughs> 39 trillion bacteria that need feeding. So at home, I used to have a cat and three fish that needed regular feeding. And now I realize I have 39 additional pets that also need feeding. So that's interesting. And I'm thinking, okay, what do I do that? But, but it's interesting to think about it, um, how we have a responsibility for this other population that somehow lives in us, right? So bacteria await their meal because they digest and they metabolize everything that we eat, which is proteins, carbohydrates, fats, and all sorts of bioactive substances, and even the synthetic chemicals in our food. So our gut starts before we were born. Our gut microbiome starts before we were born. Um, and only recently it has been discovered that um, a baby, while it's still in the womb, already receives through a few complicated pathways some of the bacteria from the mother. So the baby already creates this little microbiome center in its own gut, okay? They are put in the place 
right there in the womb. <coughs> but even afterwards, how is the baby fed the first half year, preferably? Right? Breastfeeding. That's the general recommendation. Breastfeed for as long as you possibly can. Why? Because the mum's microbiome actually continues being fed to the baby. And that's interesting. Why? Because those cells, those microbiome cells from the mum, they help the baby fight disease and infection and even cancer. So somehow, again, we have special pathways in our body that are next to the bloodstream. So through those special pathways, those mum cells are transported through the breast milk into the baby. And I think that's a miracle in itself that somehow we still continue providing protection to the baby. We always thought about, yes, sure, through breast milk we have the immune immunoglobulins that, that get in there, right, and, and that help the baby to fight infection, but it's actually not just that, but it's also special substances that feed the baby's microbiome. So 30% of a baby's gut bacteria comes indeed from the mum. So and as soon as, of course, a baby switches to a normal diet and, and eats and start starts um, solid food, the gut flora changes a little bit, of course, and bacteria and prebiotic and probiotic substances, they gain entry into the gut as well. And then by the age of three, children normally have established their own colonies, their own microbiome colonies that help them defend against uh, diseases and infections. So what does influence the microbiome? Of course, the food, right? Because that's the food that goes in and comes out. So everything that goes through is processed by the microbiome. So here we have to distinguish between prebiotic food and probiotic food. Now there's a difference. <coughs> I think you've all heard of probiotic yogurt, right? Very clearly, and, and there are plenty of um, plenty of uh, brands out there, and um, they all say, oh, it's with pro probiotic substances. Well, what does that actually mean? Probiotic means live bacteria. It means there are bacteria in that yogurt that are still alive, that haven't been cooked or boiled or processed in any way, but they're still alive, they're raw. You eat them, and they go all the way into your gut. They say hello, and they start living there as well, and, uh, you know, <laughs> get to know a new neighborhood. So those bacteria, actually, they're new buddies for your microbiome. That's probiotic food. But it's not just yogurt. It's also um, anything that's fermented. So um, I'm from Germany, obviously, so um, we eat a lot of sauerkraut. Um, quite famous for it, actually. Well, that is a probiotic food because it contains bacteria. But also tofu is a fermented soy product, right? So there's also bacteria in there. So anything that's fermented in any way, cheese, um, is is uh, full of probiotic substances, which is really live bacteria that go into your gut. Um, prebiotic substances are something else. Prebiotic substances improve the bacterial function, but they're not bacteria. So prebiotics are actually the food for your 39 trillion pets. Um, prebiotics are non-digestible, but they're non-digestible for you, but they're very digestible for your microbiome. And they themselves are not microbes, but they increase the function of the healthy gut bacteria, and they provide them the food to thrive and create healthy metabolites, healthy products that help your body fight disease. Now, let's think about it. How much food do we actually eat during a lifetime? Choose one. A few boulders from Stonehenge, an um, ancient pharaoh's statue, a few elephants, or a, or a large whale. How much food do we actually eat throughout our lifetime? 
Yeah? So about 60 tons of food. So 60 tons is a blue whale. So that's how much we actually eat in our life. Some less, some more. Um, but this is about the amount of food that pass through. So that's a lot to process, right? So it, it sh our, our trillion pets down there, they should be quite happy with that amount of food, right? But of course it depends what kind of food we eat. But before we get there, let's really think about what those pets actually do. What does the microbiome do? We know it's there, they frolic around in there, they do some good, some bad, but what exactly do they do? Um, well, the microbiome produces substances out of the food that passes through, and it produces mainly short chain fatty acids, SCFAs. Now, what are short chain fatty acids? Um, of course, we know different fats, they're good for us, saturated fat, unsaturated fat. I'm sure you've heard somehow about this, but really short chain fatty acids are fatty acids that are important for us because they fight for us. They play a unique role and there are a few um, fatty acids that are difficult to pronounce, but one of them is propionate. Propionate is a short chain fatty acid that actively lowers cholesterol. It reduces inflammation and it protects against atherosclerosis, against cardiovascular disease. And it improves digestive health and activates immune cells. Then we have butyrate, which is another short chain fatty acid. And that is the main form of energy for our gut cells in the colon and it promotes the healthy colon itself and it again has anti-inflammatory properties and it stimulates wound healing. Wound healing, think about it. And it guides stem cells to morph into different types of organs. So when something breaks, that butyrate short chain fatty acid helps fix it. Then we have acetate and that goes into the into the tissues around the gut and it stimulates another substance called leptin and that's an important one because that one suppresses hunger and it helps us stay nice and lean. So how do we get to those short chain fatty acids? Well, very simple, through fiber. Fiber and whole grains and those produce those uh, this food for our gut microbiome that in turn produces those short chain fatty acids and that in turn have all those great properties for our bodies. And of course, what they mainly do is they protect against type 2 diabetes. And that is what we want to hear, right? Then what else happens? So we have the, the, the other acid, indoleptropionic acid. Yes, I'm giving you that complicated name again. That's the one that protects against diabetes. But then let's come to the gut feeling. The gut feeling, like I told you, is something that is real because some bacteria, and I'm, I'm just giving you the names as well, Lactobacillus plantarum, right, the plant bacterium, and rhamnosus and mycoides, whatever, those three bacteria, they have endocrine function and they produce and release brain neurotransmitters and they make us feel good. So those neurotransmitters, they're missing in people with mental health issues. So for example, people with depression, they take serotonin inhibitors, right, SSRIs, because they don't have enough serotonin in their bodies. Well those gut bacteria, they produce that. And then of course we heard about dopamine. Dopamine is the reward horm hormone. So when we play a game and we win, we feel great about it. Why? Because our brain releases dopamine and says, yay, you did it. That's dopamine. That also gets produced by our gut bacteria. 
So there's plenty of other stuff like GABA and, and other um, chemicals, and they inf influence our mood. So if we feed those bacteria well, they make us feel good. And we know, let's take a logical conclusion. If we have those bacteria and we feed them well, and they produce those feel-good hormones, we actually fight mental illness and we fight mental health issues and we can fight depression just with the right nutrition. Of course, depression and, and other mental issues need treatment, but we can definitely support any treatment with the right nutrition. So even one specific um, bacterium, bifidobacteria, I think you've heard about that because that's also in some yogurts, um, that actually reduces stress and anxiety. So, so many interesting things about the gut feeling. So the gut feeling tells us to do what is right in order to feel good. So let's look at a study. There was a study um, of ridiculously healthy people. Um, that study was actually um, uh, done in China and it looked at a population of over a thousand people and they were aged between three years and a hundred years. And all of them were extremely healthy, ridiculously healthy. They had nothing, no family history, no chronic diseases, no pain, nothing. They were fine. And they looked at those thousand ridiculously healthy people. And three-year-old, I don't know, how old is your boy? <laughs> He's three, see? So three-year-old up to a hundred years old. I don't suppose there's somebody hundred years old here. But um, those two were actually identical in their health and in their gut microbiome. So that's interesting to know that all those really healthy people had one thing in common, and that was an identical composition of those 39 trillion bacteria in their gut. So the more diverse the bacteria are in our gut microbiome, the healthier we are. And we know that. Let's go back to the coral reef. It's always a big deal when a species dies. It's always a big deal when the corals dry out or die off, right? So we always hear about the global warming and about the ecosystem, and, and we, we especially hear about the dying of the coral reefs, right? So this is the same thing in our microbiome. The more diversity we have in there, the healthier we are. And, of course, that means our gut microbiome affects our ability to heal. And it surprises, out, it, it surprises us in what the gut can actually do. Now, I want, to share you, uh, I want to share with you a really interesting study. Now, when we think about scientists and studies, we think about these guys in the white lab coats, right? And with the pipettes, and they never see the daylight. Well, that's exactly right. So this is what those scientists did. They took some mice and they had, uh, they, they did a very special experiment with those mice. So um, they uh, fed, uh, those mice were completely sterile. So there were no bacteria to begin with in those mice. And they introduced a normal human, healthy, diverse gut microbiome into the mouse. Now, then they changed the diet of the mouse and they switched out the diet from a healthy, low-fat, high-fiber, plant-based diet to an unhealthy diet. High-fat, low-fiber, traditionally what we, do, what we eat here in the West. And they made those mice eat that unhealthy diet for seven weeks. What happened? Well, this diet changed everything in the gut microbiome of the mouse. Sixty percent of the diverse bacteria in that microbiome that were originally present were reduced by half, right? So that was pretty bad. Well, then they said, okay, well, let's try to fix it. Let's switch it back to a healthy plant-based diet again. And they switched it back. And what happened? Actually, those bacteria didn't come back, 
right? Only 30% of those that originally died out recovered to their previous levels. So that was quite uh, frightening to the scientists. So, so they looked at different generations. So they said, okay, what happens if we feed a certain diet to several generations? And this is why they're doing this experiment with mice, because they don't live that long, so it's easier to, to, um, to um, observe. So they said, well, they switched back, uh, and, and over generations of eating the same unhealthy diet, those healthy, diverse bacteria were killed off permanently. Okay, and after only four generations, that microbiome was just a wasteland, and um, it couldn't be fixed anymore. Now, let's think about this. This is pretty bad. This is very, very serious, because what they found out was that it created a permanent scar in the microbiome. So let's put this now on us, on humans, right? So since a few generations, um, we don't eat so healthy anymore. Since a few generations, we have chips, crisps, fried stuff, soda, coke, alcohol, smoke, right? We don't exercise anymore, so we know those generations since the last hundred years, they have had a pretty bad diet. Now, if we think about our own gut microbiome, thinking about what our parents, grandparents and great-grandparents ate, well, that's probably a little bit frightening, right? So that's the problem. Our microbiome is tied to our health defense systems. And that means cancer, infections, chronic disease, autoimmune disease, and all of those are on the rise. And now that can be directly linked to the unhealthy food that has been consumed over generations in the world. So that's a very interesting study there, and you can read it all up. I have the resources on the last slide. So what can we do? Well, we can starve the disease and we can feed our health. So there's another bacterium with another terrible name called Ackermansia muscinifila. Whatever. And that takes up between 1 and 3 percent <coughs> of all bacteria in the gut microbiome. So, you know, 3 percent of everything. But that special little bug helps control the immune system improves our blood glucose level and decreases gut inflammation and combats obesity. So let's think about this a little bit. A special diet, what do we normally do when we say, oh, I have to lose weight, I have to diet because I'm getting a bit too big. We stop eating. Well, that's exactly the wrong thing to do. Because in order to lose weight, to fight obesity, all we need to do is feed that bug. And we need to starve the other bad bugs. So interestingly, we don't need to starve ourselves, we just need to starve certain pets and, you know, really care for the other 39 trillion pets in our guts. So let's see what's happening. Um, there is something that's called dysbiosis. Dysbiosis simply means a broken gut microbiome. That just means wasteland, where all those diverse bacteria are supposed to be, they're not, right? So we know, for example, with patients that had to take antibiotics for a very long time for different reasons, um, they kill off a lot of their gut bacteria. Now, of course, in our microbiome, there are not only just the good bugs, but there are also some bad bugs, just they're being kept in check by the good ones. So there's a balance in there. But when the antibiotics treatment, for whichever reason, kills off all the good guys, the bad guys come out, and inflammation comes out, and um, 
is a very serious disease they're called C. diff, and that one nearly kills people. So serious health conditions can result out of antibiotic treatment, bad food, alcohol abuse, nicotine misuse. So all that disturbs the microbiome and leads to an abnormal, diverse, well, not so diverse microbiome. And of course, that is associated with unhealthy eating patterns and, and environmental factors and antibiotics, like I said. So what does that cause? IBS. I know a few people who suffer from IBS and it's not nice, which is inflammatory bowel disease. Food allergies. Now, we all know gluten intolerance is the new modern thing. Everything is gluten-free. Well, that actually if it were an allergy, people were not allowed to eat any gluten, okay? If it's an intolerance, people can eat a little bit, they just don't feel so good after. So um, food allergies are caused by a disturbed microbiome. Cancer, certain gastrointestinal cancers like esophageal cancer, stomach cancer, gallbladder cancer, liver cancer, all of that also goes together with an unhealthy, unbalanced gut microbiome. But not only anything related to our gut, but diseases like Alzheimer's. Interesting. Parkinson, schizophrenia. All of those patients, when you look at their gut microbiome, show that their gut microbiome is actually not functioning well. Autoimmune diseases, rheumatism, arthritis, right? Cardiovascular disease, all show an abnormal microbiome. So why? That means when the beneficial bacteria are absent, the immune system's ability to detect and fight disease and cancer is disarmed. So the wrong bacterial residents interfere with our body to defend itself. Now what makes the good guys die and the bad guys grow. I think we all want to know now, how can we do this? Come on already, tell us. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, crispy equals deadly. <laughs> it's, prob it's probably not as easy as that, but it's true. Unhealthy food is usually anything that's fried, deep fried, I should say. Anything deep fried, crispy, really yummy is probably not so healthy for you. So we're talking about crisps and chips and fried chicken, right? All of those nice things, fish and chips anyway, right? So there might be some healthy substances in there, but they're not healthy at all. Red meat. Yes, there is no benefit in red meat apart from the B12 vitamins, obviously, and all the other B vitamins, but those B vitamins can be gotten elsewhere, even in a plant-based diet. So the red meat is not that important and can actually damage our gut microbiome if eaten in excess. And then of course the usual suspects, sugar and diet coke. So all sorts of soda drinks, right? Even if they have no sugar and just artificial sweeteners, artificial sweeteners, even them, even those are bad for you, okay? So everything that tastes good is bad for you, okay? Well, I wouldn't go that far. I wouldn't want to be so depressing. So let's see what we can actually do. And it's not so bad. It's okay, right? So we can save ourselves. We can save the gut microbiome. We can save that immune system it, because there's food out there that has immediate benefits and it can regenerate the gut microbiome in as, as little as 24 hours. So what can you do to make your gut and yourself feel better and healthier? That's by eating fermented foods, like sauerkraut, like kimchi, the Korean equivalent, cheese, yogurt, or even sourdough bread. Okay, stay away from the white bread, but go get the sourdough. And of course, less animal protein. Yes, I know, animals and vegetarian diet 
And, you know, I'm not a vegetarian, I have to tell you that, but you know what, I'm aiming for it because this is what can save you, okay? So try to switch from animal products to plant-based. And of course, it's easy to do with soy product and tofu. I will close my eyes to a little bit of fish as long as it's not deep fried, okay? Uh, of course, you need to increase dietary fiber, okay? And whole food. Where's dietary fiber? That's, of course, in grains and in nuts and in fruits and in legumes, which is beans and lentils and all of those, okay? So a lot of fiber. When you think about plant-based diet, think fiber, okay? And then, of course, more fresh food and less processed food. So you can go for frozen vegetables or fresh vegetables, but stay away from the canned stuff except tomato sauce. Um, so really, what is the rule of thumb here? Well, if it's, if it's fermented, it's good for you. If it contains a lot of fiber, it's good for you. If it has no animal protein, it's good for you. And if it's not processed, it's good for you. Now here, I have to give you a little caveat. Um, because many supermarkets now sell vegan food, like vegan burgers. No, no chicken nuggets and no fish fingers or what, whatever they're called, right? So you can get those and it's great. It's a good initiative and I appreciate that now vegetarians and vegans are actually better catered for in this society, which is great. But some of those foods are also highly processed and that makes them bad. Okay, so you have to be careful and the rule of thumb is just cook your own food. <laughs> That's the easiest thing to do, right? And you can do that in under 30 minutes. There are plenty of recipes out there. I don't have to give you the recipes because it's not rocket science. So you have immediate benefits from switching to a high fiber, fermented, plant-based, fresh diet. So how do we care for our microbiome? What can we actually eat? Which foods should we eat? And I know there are different fats and superfoods out there. Um, I remember when the goji berry was the newest berry out there, like, oh, it has so many benefits, eat the goji berries. And you know, and, and it was funny, it was, I was still living in Germany back then with my family and we were, and my mom had just bought go a, a little bag of dried goji berries. And um, we tried it out, we, we all had one. It was a bit bitter in the beginning, and then once you swallowed it down, it tasted a bit sweet. And my husband, Pastor Julian, he said, well, it tastes a bit like the Book of Revelation, right? <laughs> so um, there are, of course, different, different superfoods out there. But basically, the modern industrial food that we're consuming in the world has, of course, shifted our microbiome towards the less healthy profile and we have to fight it, okay? So whatever we're eating also as children can either benefit us or plague us later on in life as adults. So let's look at all of those products that are out there that will make you feel good. And I'm taking them from a very good book, Eat to Beat Disease by Dr. William Lee. Okay, so he's a, he's a very good scientist in nutrition and it's a very good book that I'm really promoting. This book is very nice. And basically, again, those foods are not rocket science. Soy products, tomatoes, broccoli and cauliflower, everything that kids basically don't want to eat, right? Kale, but also stone fruits. Stone fruits are peaches, cherries, anything with a stone in it, even mangoes. Right, and any kinds of berries are great. Even fish, even chicken to an extent, as long as it's not red meat. Green tea, superfood. Cheese, of course, fermented drinks like kefir. But fermented drinks can also be alcohol-free beer. 0.0. .0. Actually, Dr. William Lee makes a very special note in his book, and he's a secular scientist, he's not Adventist, and he says alcohol has no health benefit whatsoever. So all those health benefits that people might say, oh, a, a glass of wine a day, all those come just from the grapes. So 
people that drink grape juice have the same health benefits without the bad stuff that alcohol brings along, okay? So no alcohol, just the fermented drinks. So alcohol-free beer, free, alcohol-free beer, zero, zero, okay? Not less than 0 0.5, right? That is actually quite healthy. Then, of course, olive oil, nuts, beans, even dark chocolate. Not the sweet chocolate, but the dark chocolate. Yes, it needs a little bit getting used to, but it's good. And of course, spices and herbs and grains. Now, all those foods are great. And again, whenever we go in the supermarket and we see the fresh food, let's just get lots of different foods out there. Because the best secret to feed our gut microbiome is diversity. So what we actually should be eating in a week is not five a day. So five plants a day, five fruits a day, right? but 30 different kinds of plants a week. Now that's a better rule because we don't all can keep track of our foods. Everybody's at work. It's, it's tricky sometimes to manage different foods, especially on a budget. But if you aim for 30 different kinds of plants a week, it's easier to plan. Now 30 different kinds of plants, what does it look like? You eat porridge for breakfast. Well, instead of just having the porridge oats, throw in some flax seed and some chia seeds. And then you have a diverse porridge, okay, that has three different kinds of plants already. If you put some cinnamon in it and some nuts and seeds and a berry on top, you're fine, okay? That already counts for one whole day of diversity for your gut microbiome. Then basically everything you cook, from a stew to a tomato sauce for your noodles, Anything you cook at all, throw in as many vegetables and as many plants as you possibly can. Like as a rule, whatever I cook, I always throw in a carrot. It doesn't matter what I cook, carrot. Um, onion, obviously, garlic, obviously. What else do we throw in? Yeah, a bit of spinach, a bit of kale, right? So as long as you have those different colors in there, you're good because you're feeding your gut microbiome with a diverse diet. So the more var variety you eat, the better it is for your gut microbiome. So again, if you want to fight disease, fight diabetes, fight hypertension, fight obesity, don't stop eating, but start eating the right foods. Now, just one last note on how to cook those foods. We remember, crispy is deadly, right? So let's think about rather stir frying, which means very quickly throwing it all together in a pan with a little bit of oil, right? Blanching, steaming, simmering, poaching, slow cooking, baking, marinating, pickling. They're all different ways how we can cook our food, okay? None of them include deep fryer or microwaves. Now, it takes a little bit of work, but it will actually benefit you. And you know what? The interesting thing is since I switched my diet to be as diverse as possible, I actually liked it. So I thought, oh, I'd be so depressed without my chocolate. I'd be so depressed without you know, my fish and chips on a Friday. But actually, I don't like it anymore because the good guys have won. And I think you can switch too. So thank you very much. I hope you've learned a little bit about the microbiome and if you have any questions, bombard me. <laughs>
you know, if you get different kinds of plants in your child's diet, it works. So um, the, my rule with my daughter is always, you cannot say you don't like it if you haven't tried it twice. Mm. Okay, so... <laughs> And there, I already got two bites in there, even if she doesn't like it in the end, she has had two bites, yay! <laughs> so, um, so, you know, just, just try. Because when I think of my grandmother, when she was little, all the things that she told me, well, when there was no other food, she ate what her mom cooked, okay? So, um, I know we all spoil our kids, I spoil for sure mine, but just try to think of the future and um, how you can feed that child. And you know, it's, it's of course negotiation basis, but try a plant-based diverse diet, even with children. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Thank you. Good evening. I have Good seen evening. that they are now doing the probiotic tablets. Mm. Does that make sense? Well. If they're probiotic, that means there's bacteria in there. Sure, it makes sense. Um, I can imagine that they might be a bit costly. Um, I wouldn't say that they're not good for you, but I say there are cheaper options out there and easier options. So if you go for probiotic yogurt and other fermented foods, you can even make your own sauerkraut. You can even um, pickle your own things, right? Then you can do all of that that, that you get in a little tablet. You get cheaper. And it tastes better, probably. <laughs> you know, I don't like swallowing pills. So, um, you know, producing all of that is easy. Uh, for example, um, you can order, um, I, I drink kefir very regularly. So those are little, uh, well, little mushrooms. They're not mushrooms, they're fungi. So they're little blobs. And you put them in milk overnight. And next day you have nice fermented milk that tastes a bit like yogurt. And it's kefir. And um, you can do this yourself, and you can buy it in, at Amazon. Um, and it's quite easy to make. And, um, you know, store-bought kefir costs a lot of money, but homemade doesn't cost anything, right? So um, the pills, are, I'm sure they're really good. But, you know, homemade options are usually tastier. Mm. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, How many times do we have to eat? Oh, very good. How old are you? Six. Six? Very good. Six. Well, you need to eat at least five times a day, if not more, because you're little and your stomach is smaller than our stomach. Okay, so usually breakfast, healthy snack, lunch, healthy snack, supper, right? Um, now, here's your rule. You cannot have an unhealthy snack until you haven't had two healthy snacks, okay? So if you want to have your whatever you're eating that's unhealthy, maybe a donut in the afternoon, you have to have half a carrot and half a banana before you eat the donut, and then you can enjoy it, okay? So the rule is healthy, healthy, unhealthy, healthy, healthy, unhealthy, okay? And then you're fine. For adults, well, good news and bad news. We don't need to eat that much. Actually, two times a day is just enough, okay? And um, unfortunately, as here's the bad news, um, there's nothing like a healthy snack because our gut needs also a break. So if you can, you know, somehow take a break of four hours between consuming anything, you're okay. So breakfast at 8, that means lunch at 12, and then, you know, four hours later, four hours later. So, you know, give yourself a break, okay? So two to three meals a day are fine for adults. And if you need a snack, have a glass of water and a slice of lemon. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks for that presentation. Really, really interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. I just wanted to ask you, how about, for those people who like frying, fish and chips on a Friday. Mm -hmm. How about the use of alternative ways of frying? For example, the air fryer. What do you think about that? Is that not a uh, good idea? Well, I have an air fryer. <laughs> I, I do use it for the f infamous alphabets, of course. Now, 
there are good things and bad things about frying in general. Air fryer obviously has much less fat. So obviously the food that we put in the air fryer contains less fat. However, the oil is still superheated. Now oil that is heated really, really high to high degrees that contains substances that are not good for you. Now in an air fryer, um, those substances are a little bit less than in a deep fryer, but in the end, under the line, you still get them in your body. So just fry as little as possible. Another option is, for example, baking. Um, just shove things in the oven and bake them. Um, so for example, like what I love is, for example, a piece of salmon. And instead of frying that, you just put it in the oven with a bit of oil, wrap it in, wrap it in aluminum foil, put a bit of lemon and some herbs and a tomato and garlic. Anyway, so, so you can, there are alternatives of cooking um, to frying. And I would just say, fry as little as possible and then you're on the safe side. And never reuse the oil, always exchange the oil. So with the air fryer, mm -hmm. you don't need to use oil at all, do you? So if you're not using oil, is the air fryer not okay? Well, then yes, of course, that is fine. The whole point is that oil gets super, super hot, and that's when oil becomes unhealthy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've heard people talk about colon cleansing. Does it have any effect on the good guys? Uh, a cleansing diet, yeah. Or not or really cleansing diet, cleansing, but, but, but to actually go and... Oh, the enemas and all of that. And, and use hydro. <laughs> I well have he I've heard people saying that. I'm just asking. Well, um, they can have a benefit in very special cases. So everything is case by case and always in consultation with your GP. For example, if people have a special bowel condition and they already have a disturbed microbiome, it would make sense that a microbiome gets flushed out and gets replaced by a good one, okay? Um, so this helps. However, you don't really need the hydrotherapy and all of that. It would not be my thing personally, but um, you can just fast. Fasting is healthy. If you fast for a week, you also flush everything out and it's a bit easier and it's not such a shock to the system. Um, of course, it takes a bit more willpower. <laughs> mm. And um, now, interesting, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna share this with you while we're at the disgusting stuff. <laughs> um, new, uh, a new treatment option for irritable bowels uh, and other bowel conditions is fecal transplants. Okay, it means actually flushing out all the bad guys, right? And then getting a transplant from a healthy gut microbiome in your gut, okay? And then those bacteria, they then um, multiply and get into your gut. So that is a new method of treatment and actually works very well, okay? It's just we don't really have it in our heads just yet, we know because we think, ooh, <laughs> but, but this is actually a new treatment option. Okay, so yes, um, flushing out the good guy, the, the bad guys and replacing them with good guys is usually the, 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 the point where you, want to, wh where you want to arrive. How you arrive there is really up to you. Uh, yes, I want to ask on the, mm -hmm. the effect of a microwave. If I get my warm my food using a microwave, is, is there any effect on us? Um, um, so sorry again. The use of a microwave. Okay, a microwave, yeah, well, <laughs> microwaves, <laughs> pros and cons. Microwave heats up food and it doesn't really heat up food. So I use microwave to, to heat up a bit of milk in the morning to put in my tea, right? But it's, it's really, it's not a good cooking method because it, 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 um, the, the infrared rays, they make the molecules move and they um, specifically make, I don't really know um, the me true mechanism of the microwave. But what it does, it heats the food up from the inside and not from the outside. Okay, so when you put an egg in a microwave, it explodes, right? Because it gets heated from the inside and not from the outside. Now, when you heat things from the outside in a pan, in an oven, in a pot, right? I mean, you put them in hot oil or in hot, in hot water or in hot air, and then they get heated up from the outside. That means all the nutrients are actually trapped inside and they stay in the food 
with a microwave, they get kind of destroyed from the inside, okay? They don't get trapped, but they just get dissolved. So um, there's pros and cons, obviously. Um, I wouldn't say a microwave, throw it away, it's the worst thing possible. Just, it's not the healthiest option to cook. If you need to, if you need to reheat something, you know, you can might as well do it in a pan. Um, I want to say thank you for um, your suggestion of 30 a week because I haven't That's heard it before. I don't know if it's your mm -hmm. original or you. No, no, it's, 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 it's the latest study, it's the latest science. Yeah, I haven't week, yeah. known it. And actually, it's um, so inspiring because my children like their own fruit. So my son maybe eats fruit, but only apples and grapes, and my daughter only eats this and that. So um, thank you for that. And I wanted to ask you, what would you recommend as an option for the daily sandwiches in school meals? Mm, school because, meals. Because, um, uh, you know, they don't like to eat what I'd like to give them healthy because their friends might laugh at them. Then even if you go for the school meals, they're quite expensive and not that healthy. Most of the food is mm -hmm. just um, semi-prepared food. Uh, lately, in some secondary schools in Coventry, they even brought Burger King and McDonald's, like similar, yeah. So it's very unhealthy from school. And then when I give them sandwiches, they prefer white bread, which I know is very unhealthy. But if I swap with something else, they just throw it in the bin. So w I don't know how to compromise and still get something healthy. Thank you. Well, I know this is doesn't help much, but I'm in the same boat. <laughs> um, but but yes, um, children need a little bit more carbohydrates than we do. So if children don't eat the whole wheat bread because they don't like it, if they eat white bread, it's not terrible as long as they eat their vegetables, okay? Um, the vegetables are the most important thing. So um, it's, it's always up for... Sorry, up for discussion and nego negotiation. So what I put in my daughter's lunchbox is usually a couple of cream crackers because she likes those and I know she will eat them and not throw them. <laughs> That's a good thing. And um, she likes those cherry tomatoes. Those are great. She will just eat them, blah, blah, blah. Um, a couple of raw kidney beans, actually, from the can. So cooked beans are actually quite tasty. So she likes those. And um, carrots, you know, apple pieces salary so so all of these things are good um the other option is of course something that um they might like a bit better so if you use your sourdough bread instead of whole grain because my daughter specifically doesn't like the bits and pieces in the whole grain bread mm -hmm. she doesn't mind the bread so if you get a sourdough bread without grains in there that's also okay so you just you just use you know whatever you know even even a thin layer of butter um, or something you know anything homemade that's good. You can make a pretty tasty spread with eggplants or with cauliflower, but all of this depends on the taste of your children because children are very picky. So um, just try it out. Mm. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So um, put as many plants and vegetables as possible in there. And if they eat those, that's great. So again, just try to give them 30 different kinds of plants during the week. So that could be uh, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, nuts, as if they don't have an allergy, obviously. By the way, tree nuts, not peanuts. Okay, so walnuts, pecans, all of those. Um, so so it's, it's really a, a thing for discussion with children, and I know it's very tricky, but if you get your raw vegetables in there, you're usually in a good way. Um, what, what's your take on, um, or what do you think about black pepper? Um, you know, the, the red, green, yellow peppers, you know, the capsicums. What, what's your take on that? And what, what about olives? What do you think about those? Well, um, herbs and anything plant-based is technically good. And I have to say also, again, the research says spicy food is not unhealthy. But of course, it always very much depends on our preference. And then we also know that our, our um, health prophet, our founder, E.G. White, she was very much against black pepper um, because, of course, spicy food was a, a bit unknown at that time. Um, but it is, of course, our own preference. There's different kinds of spice. So we don't need to, we can make food spicy without pepper. 
if you just put ginger, ginger can be super spicy, just put ginger instead of pepper. And in your case, cinnamon can actually be very spicy. Okay, so, so anything that's any spice that is plant-based is generally quite good. Um, olives, perfect. Olives are great food. Olive oil, extra virgin olive oil is always recommended. So olives themselves are even better. So um, I would always recommend olives. And then there are, of course, different kinds. Always try to go for the most natural ones that are not processed. Okay, so if you find olives that still contain the stone, you can tell that they're not as processed as the pickled ones that have been going through many different processes. They've been cooked, they have been filled, they've been scrubbed. So, so try to stay away from... Pro so so the, the, the rule of thumb is really easy. Not processed and rather fresh. So um, actually feeding your microbiome is easier than adhering to a special diet um, because you don't need to change your food or your eating habits. You just need to change the way you look at food. So instead of frying it, you can stir fry it or bake it. Instead of getting getting the processed stuff, you just get it fresh. So instead of getting you know um, um, the, the the easy things, you just get them fermented. So you just need to change your diet a little bit to make it healthy already. I'd like to thank you, sister. Oh. Can we take one more? Sorry. Oh, one last question. Yeah. One last question. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Uh, I'm still. Um, puzzled about the probiotics. Mm -hmm. I'm still puzzled. Um, she mentioned tablets and they are coming in their hard, uh, you know, they are, I thought they were living. But if they are in tablet form, they must be dead. They must be, you know. Yeah. And then uh, thinking of fermented stuff, when I was growing up, they would ferment like some sort of um, flour and make porridge out of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, doesn't that kill the probiotic if, if it's living by cooking it and making it porridge? Is it still alive? Is it still, uh, because I'm thinking of a living organism. And then when we boil it or cook it, we are already killing it. It's just trying to understand that we are talking of sourdough bread. It's already baked. Is it still fermenting when it's baked, baked or the process happens before? And then that's when the the, those biotics, whatever they are called, are still alive. Um, you're right. Um, cooking and baking generally kills, right? I mean, it's supposed to kill bacteria. That's why we cook food in the first place, right? Um, but if it's if it's probiotic, um, a few always are left over. You can never kill everything. And um, that's why in the surgery theater, you have these very special sterilization machines that heat up the, the surgical tools to do really, really high, hundreds of hundreds of degrees to really kill all the bacteria. When we cook food, it usually gets heated up to 90, 100 degrees, maybe for a short time. That never kills everything. So, so um, and if you simmer something or slow cook something, you don't heat it up to 100 degrees anyway. So some bacteria are always left over. And, of course, we know how bacteria um, procreate, how they multiply. You just need one. And then it divides into two, right? So if one bacterium is still left over, you're still okay. We'd like to thank Dr. Strati. I think we can say we've been enlightened, but at the same time we've been challenged to rethink our eating strategy. Um, I, I, I felt good. When, when we heard the part that said, you don't have to eat less. Uh, anyway, I won't go any further. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Kostrati. We God have bless. really learned a lot tonight. Well, we've come to the end of our, our um, program for tonight. Um, the week is going well. Last night we looked at the cooking side of things. Tonight we looked at the eating and what's going on in our gut. And tomorrow night, we are looking at exercise. Now, the truth is, we all need to exercise. Somebody said, you need to exercise more, Pastor. Anyway, we all need to exercise. And tomorrow night, we have with us uh, Team GB coach uh, Joe Keynes.
he will be with us. Uh, he asks that you come in your loose garments, track suits if possible. Um, no matter the age, no matter the ability, he will have an exercise for every age and for every ability. Sounds good. Looking forward to seeing you tomorrow night. Uh, if you didn't make it down here in person tonight, still, uh, you can come tomorrow evening. It promises to be also enlightening and challenging. We wish you a good night. We'll just pray before we close, and then uh, we look forward to see you tomorrow night. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for what we have learned tonight. We thank you that we have been uh, challenged to, to rethink our eating strategy, recognizing that some things are definitely not good for us and some things are definitely better for us. Lord, help us to make the, the, the change that we need for the best within our bodies. Bless us as we leave this place and bring us back tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen.